Thank you to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to come and speak, and thank you for coming and listening. Uh, I'm going to start by stating a quite classical theorem, which goes back to Bowen and Margulis for no soft flows. And once I do that, so I'll fill that in momentarily, and once I do, I'll then state a result which is ostensibly the purpose of this talk, and this is joint work with Gerhard Knieper and Kadi Moir, and this is from this year. <clears throat> so the general theorem will have to do has to do with topologically mixing a nose of flows. This new theorem is uh, the more geometric one. It's in the setting of geodesic flows with no conjugate points, but we'll come to that. So let me state the general theorem, which I imagine many of you are familiar with. Suppose we have a topologically mixing a nose of flow. on some smooth manifold, then the following are true. First, there exists a unique measure of maximal entropy. That is, among all the invariant Borel probability measures, there is exactly one with the property that the measure theoretic entropy is equal to the topological entropy for the time one map, and from now on, I'll denote this by H. So M is the unique MME, H is the topological entropy. And this measure of maximal entropy has a lot of structure and a lot of properties, of course. So one of them is that it has a product structure. So I'll use LPS to abbreviate local product structure. And what this means is that the flow itself being an Anosov flow has a local product structure, so I can consider some box like this, where horizontal is the unstable direction, vertical is the stable direction, and into the board is the time direction. Now there's a bit of a fib here, of course, because you can build this box in a couple different ways. You can take a weak unstable and then foliate by stables, or you can take a weak stable and then foliate by unstables, and you don't necessarily get the same thing, but for the asymptotic estimates that we'll eventually get, it doesn't matter which you do. That's a topological statement. The measure theoretic statement is that the measure of maximal entropy is the direct product of leaf measures on the stable, on the unstable, and Lebesgue measure on the orbits. And these are not just any measures. The third property, which is quite crucial, is that there are certain scaling properties. So if you look at how these measures on the leaves scale, and hidden in this product structure is a statement that these measures are the leaf measures are invariant under holonomies, but let me not write that. The thing I'm most interested in is that the stable and unstable leaf measures, if you push them forward under the flow, they scale by a constant factor according to the topological entropy. So if you take the time t map of the flow, you push the leaf measures forward, you know exactly how they scale. And it's not a nonlinear scaling as you would get if you looked at distance, but rather it's a perfectly linear scaling, which, is, which characterizes them as the conditionals of the Bowen-Margulis measure. Uh, let's see, what else do we need? I want to also point out that the flow is mixing with respect to the uh, Bowen-Margulis measure. And the last two properties have to do with periodic orbits. So, in addition to those four properties above, we have that the periodic orbits equidistribute to the measure of maximal entropy. So if I define a measure nu t, 
as follows. I take a sum over all periodic orbits of length t plus minus epsilon. So here, I should probably write this. This means the set of all periodic orbits for which some period, not necessarily the least period, uh, actually it'll, it'll be true either way, um, so it doesn't matter which one you take as your definition. The period should be within epsilon of t. And you take Lebesgue measure restricted to each of these closed orbits. You take a sum over all orbits and then you normalize. So I have to normalize by dividing by the number of orbits. And then I also need to normalize by the length. Uh, I'm going to cheat just a little and normalize by t instead of by the actual length. In the limit as t goes to infinity, it doesn't make a difference. The equidistribution result is that in the weak star topology, these converge to the MME. And this is true for every epsilon greater than zero, and this convergence is as t goes to infinity. So this is the equidistribution result. And finally, <clears throat> using all of those properties, one can, Margulis proved a very uh, precise asymptotic for the number of periodic orbits. So by this notation, I mean the number of periodic orbits whose period is between zero and t. If I divide, uh, no, that's not the way I want to write it. I want to write it like this. So this squiggly notation means that these two things are asymptotic. So the notation, my notation will be that AT is asymptotic to B of T means that the ratio converges to one. And I should point out that although I attributed this theorem to Bowen and Margulis, the fact that the ratio between these sides converges to one is, I believe, due to Charles Toll and his 1984 thesis. The rest of it was proved already by Bowen and Margulis. Okay, so that's the classical result. And of course, a corollary of this is that if I take a manifold of negative curvature, so a compact, connected, smooth, Riemannian manifold whose curvature is everywhere negative, all sectional curvatures. And I let Ft denote the geodesic flow on the unit tangent bundle. That is, the flow which takes a unit tangent vector v to the tangent vector to the unique geodesic that it determines. So Cv is the unique geodesic determined by the tangent vector v as its starting conditions. You move for time t, you take the tangent vector to the geodesic at that time, and that gives you your image under the geodesic flow. This is, in some sense, the classical example of an Anosov flow, and therefore the theorem applies it. This is topologically mixing, and so you get all of the above results. And that moves us into the more geometric statements, since this is a geometric setting of geodesic flow and sets me up to state the new result, which has to do with geodesic flow not in negative curvature, but in a more general setting. So I want to consider the case where M is a surface, a closed surface, so nothing, no funny business, a closed connected surface of genus at least two. And the only assumption I'm placing on the metric is that it has no conjugate points. Um, 
So the first line is just a topological statement, and I'm assuming that it has a, that I'm equipping it with a metric that has no conjugate points. And if you would like a definition of this, one equivalent definition is that if X is the universal cover, then for all distinct points in the universal cover, there exists a unique geodesic connecting them. So you don't have to have negative curvature, but you do have to have this no conjugate points property. And the theorem is that under these assumptions, every single one of those statements is true. Well, modulo one small <laughs> modification which is, of course, you can modify the metric in such a way that you have infinitely many periodic orbits of a given length by just flattening it, for example, around a single periodic orbit. So you could take a metric of negative curvature, deform it so it has a flat cylinder. Now you have an infinite number of periodic orbits with the same length, and so, of course, these don't make sense anymore. But the solution is simply to replace periodic orbits by free homotopy classes of periodic orbits. The orbits on this cylinder are all in the same free homotopy class and all have the same length. And in fact, that's a general fact that within a free homotopy class in this setting, all closed geodesics would have the same length. So we can make this small modification and just say that if we want P, so whether it's P of T plus minus epsilon or P from zero to T, we want it to count free homotopy classes of periodic orbits. Okay. So now we have two theorems and I should say something about techniques. So I want to start by going back to our roots and outlining the way that the classical theorem is proved. And then I'll give some indication of how those tools uh, need to be modified in order to prove the uh, present result. <coughs> so for the time being, let's just do some uniform hyperbolicity theory. In the Inosov setting, well, the first thing I suppose I should <coughs> clarify is that there are, of course, quite a few different ways to prove the different parts of this theorem. So I'm certainly not saying the only proof. I'm saying, and it may not even be the original proof in all instances, but it's the approach to it that makes the most sense for our generalization. And the first step is to get existence and uniqueness of the measure of maximal entropy. One way to do that, this was Bowen's approach, is to use specification and expansivity. So what do I mean by specification? Specification is a property which is satisfied by topologically mixing and no flows. Roughly speaking, it says the following. For every uh, delta greater than zero, there exists some time. I want to think of delta as a shadowing scale and T as a gap time or relaxation time or transition time. And the property that you should satisfy is that for every list of orbit segments,
So you give me some list of orbit segments. It doesn't matter how long these segments are. It doesn't matter how many of them there are. I should be able to produce a single orbit that shadows each of them in turn to within delta. And the amount of time it takes to transition from one to the next is exactly t. If it's mixing, you can do it equal. If it's, if it's transitive, it should be less than or equal. Either one is sufficient for uniqueness. And in our generalization, we'll have to relax it to less than or equal to. But I don't think I'll state things in that detail. So this is a property uh, which, in some sense, you can think of as replacing the Markov property if you're, more if you're more used to thinking of hyperbolic systems from the point of view of Markov partitions and this kind of machinery. This gives you some kind of product structure. It says that every past can be followed by every future. The other tool that is needed is expansivity. And I wish I would like to formulate this as follows. Say that a point x, well, the property which you have here is that every point x is expansive. So I want to interpret expansivity as a pointwise property. What I mean for expansivity to hold at a point x is that if I consider the set of points whose orbit remains within the orbit of remains within epsilon, so I, there needs to be a scale here. So I guess what I really need is that there exists epsilon greater than zero such that every x is expansive at scale epsilon. And this means that if you consider the set of points y whose orbit remains within epsilon of the orbit of x for all time, that in fact, this is contained in the orbit of x. So then it's contained in a finite, it's contained in a small piece of the orbit of x. So of course you can accomplish this by just taking a point which is close to x on its orbit, and that's the only way to do it. I will again point out that this is not quite the original definition of expansivity. If you go back to some of the early papers on expansivity for flows, um, but this is the definition which is suited for our proof later on. Okay, these two together imply that there exists a unique measure of maximal entropy, and that was proved by Bowen. Once you have it, you want to say something about its properties. And the local product structure uh, really requires a different construction of the MME. You, you, you don't get a local product structure for free out of the specification expansivity approach. So this is really Margulis's construction, and uh, I'm not going to go into the details of his construction because we do it somewhat differently. Uh, let me just say that properties two and three are by construction. You, uh, Margulis builds a family of leaf measures on stables and a family of leaf measures on unstables, which satisfy the right scaling properties. And he does this via a fixed point theorem in an appropriate functional space. And then once they satisfy these scaling properties, you build the local product measure, and then you check that it's a measure of maximal entropy. Um, there, are, there are a few different ways to approach this construction. Uh, you can also interpret, you, you can also construct measures like this via a Carthay-Adori dimension characteristic approach. So you build them as a Hausdorff measure 
uh, either build them as a Hausdorff measure for a particular metric, or you adopt the definition of uh, Bowen's definition of topological entropy as a dimension type characteristic and take the associated measure. But all of this is not how we do it in the geodesic flow case, so let me not get into details. In our case, it will be done via patterson solomon construction, just to give you the spoilers. Okay, item four is mixing. And once you have local product structure, one way you can get mixing is via the Hopf argument. And again, I don't want to say any more about the details, just to emphasize that the key to getting mixing is to have this local product structure. And five is actually quite a general thing once you know you can produce enough periodic orbits. So the idea for five is to use a closing lemma. to show that you have enough periodic orbits. So recall the definition of topological entropy. Topological entropy counts the growth rate of the number of orbits that separate by a certain amount. And then if you have a closing lemma, you can take these orbits and close them into periodic orbits. This is essentially a specification property. And thus you can deduce that the number of periodic orbits in this ray in this set grows with the right exponential rate and then there's a very general argument that just says that <clears throat> once you have that 5 must hold so the equidistribution result really is, uh, this, this is sort of half of the proof of the variational principle, that if you have a collection of orbit segments which is growing with the right exponential rate, and you take the measures which are equidistributed along those orbit segments, then they converge to a measure of maximal entropy. Because it's unique, it must be, in fact, m. Okay, so that was a very rushed overview, but the reason for rushing is that I want to spend my time on number six. Um, so this asymptotic estimate is, of course, a very classical result. It goes back 50 years now, but it's, it's a proof which uh, I learned quite recently, and so I'm still in this stage where I want to show the proof to other people because I think it's a beautiful proof. Um, and we modify it to get our result. So let me attempt to give a 10-minute summary of Margulis's proof. We'll see how it goes. Uh, the idea is to take a product set like this. So B here is what we make, what Margulis or someone at least calls a flow box. And the idea is to look at how this intersects itself. Because if you count the orbits which go through this, then of course every periodic orbit that intersects this set corresponds to a return of B to itself. And if the periodic orbit has length T plus minus epsilon, then if it has length T minus epsilon, you have a point near the back which comes net back near the front. And so at time T, it's, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. If it's time T plus epsilon, then you have uh, something like back to back in T plus epsilon, so back to front in time T. And if it's T minus epsilon, then you have front to back in time T. And the point is that every periodic orbit in this set corresponds in some sense to a point which in B which returns to B in time exactly T. And so we want to study this intersection. So let's see what this intersection looks like. If you take the box B and flow it backwards through time T, the unstable cur direction contracts, the stable direction expands, and you have something like this. The flow direction still has length exactly epsilon, so no change there. And if you look at how this 
intersects the original flow box, well, so you should picture this not as being a, you know, a column, of course, but it should actually wrap around the manifold in some way. So maybe, we're, maybe I'm drawing something in the universal cover. Who knows? Uh, and at some point, it intersects the original box. But it doesn't have to line in the depth direction. It doesn't have to line up exactly. There's a certain depth to the intersection. So your intersections look Okay, it's a poor picture, but it's probably the best I'll do. So let's let B gamma denote the connected components of this intersection. And you may have a few problems around the boundary, but we're going to ignore those because they don't contribute to the asymptotics. Most of the time, this connected component is going to be something like this that crosses the box completely in the vertical direction, partially in the horizontal direction, and, well, it has some depth. So let's call the depth delta gamma. So this is how deep it goes, and this is somewhere between zero and epsilon. Now, the first crucial observation is that when you have a connected component like this, so first off, to every periodic orbit, you associate such a connected component, but it also goes the other way, by the closing lemma. So if you have a, such a component like this, it contains a periodic orbit, that's the standard closing lemma, and so the correspondence which we actually get is the following. There's a correspondence, and let me call this lemma one. There's a correspondence between a one-to-one -one correspondence, at least asymptotically, between these connected components, and okay, now I should be a little more precise. Of course, a single periodic orbit may intersect B many times and may go through many of these components. So what you're actually counting is the number of intersection, the number of, ep of epsilon segments in which a periodic orbit of the appropriate length intersects the box. So you can count the number of connected components or you can count the number of these epsilon segments. And, it's a, and asymptotically, they're going to give you the same answer. So that's the first thing, and I should write it down. This direction is the closing lemma. Since that's a tool we need later on. So that's the first observation one must make. What's the second observation? The second observation is that thanks to these scaling properties, we can say something about the measure of these connected components. So, lemma two is that the measure, bowen margulis measure, of one of these connected components, well, what is it? It's a product measure. So I have to take the product of the, of the unstable, the stable, and the depth. The stable is the same as the size of B, because it completely crosses B. The unstable, well, it doesn't completely cross B right now, but if I iterate it for time t, it will. And by that point, it has scaled by a factor of e to the ht. And then it has some depth, which is, well, which is just a number which I wrote down. So the point is that this measure is the measure of the box B scaled by e to the minus ht, that's the scaling in the unstable direction, times the ratio of the depth to epsilon. So this follows from item three in the original theorem. Now, the second part which of this same lemma is that if we average this over all of the components, well, the only thing that's changing between components is the depth. And the average depth, okay, 
if you believe that mixing says that the depth is uniformly distributed over zero and epsilon, then you should guess quite quickly that the average depth is epsilon over two. And that can be proved with a little more pain. So in particular, the average measure of one of these components is, so this is epsilon over two, I'm dividing it by epsilon, so this is just the measure of the box times e to the minus ht times one half. Okay, so now I'm in a position to just in fact do a relatively short computation that gives the asymptotics. So what's the idea? The idea is to estimate this number, the number of periodic orbits with length uh, between t minus epsilon, t plus epsilon, and then take a Riemann sum. So if you want all the periodic orbits with length between zero and t, well, okay, you can start at one because there's no periodic orbits whose lengths accumulate to zero, so it's okay to start at some lower bound. Chop this interval up into pieces of length two epsilon, and tk is the point in the middle, so this is the sum uh, for over some range of k of the number of these guys. So I want to use the two lemmas to get an estimate on this, and then take a limit as epsilon goes to zero to get an integral formula for this, which gives the actual asymptotic, okay? So here's the computation. The number of periodic orbits appeared here in the formula for the, me for the measures on periodic orbits that converge to the MME. So I can write this as the sum over periodic orbits in the appropriate length of the Lebesgue measure on the periodic orbit. And I'm going to do the measure of the box. So this is from the definition. Now as I send t to infinity, that denominator is going to the MME of the box. So that's by equidistribution, which was, I guess, item five. Also, by lemma one, which said that there's this correspondence between all the epsilon segments of these intersections and gamma of t, this numerator is just epsilon times the number of components, because every component contributes a single epsilon segment to that length. So this is by Lemma one. Now I need to say something about the number of components. Well, I, have, I know what the average measure of a component is and I know how the average measure, well, what I know. Okay, so this is asymptotically equal to the following. The number of components is the measure of their union. The union, remember, these are the components of B intersect F minus TB. And so what I want is the ratio between that and the average measure of a component. This is, this is the definition of average. So the average measure uh, goes into the total measure this many times. But now I have a formula for the average measure by lemma two. So this gives me epsilon over t times the measure of this divided by what? Well, there's an mb from here. The average gives me an mb, another mb, so that's mb squared. And then I have one over e to the minus ht times one half. And now, of course, you see what's coming. We know that it's mixing. So this was lemma two. And therefore, this ratio goes to one. So we end up with two epsilon times e to the positive ht divided by t by mixing, which was item four. 
And then from once you plug this into this Riemann sum, this turns into an integral and a little more computation, which I don't think it's productive to show, it gives this formula. So you see it's only a one line proof. Um, <clears throat> But now the question is how we adapt it, and I think I have all of five minutes to explain that. So let me say how these things carry over into the setting that I'm ostensibly interested in, which is these geodesic flows without conjugate points. The, four, the pieces which are relevant are specification, expansivity, the product structure, and the closing lemma. So let me very quickly say something about these pieces and how we use them. Specification. You're on a surface of genus two. This means that the surface carries another metric of negative curvature. In fact, constant negative curvature, but we don't need that. Um, this is an Anosov, the geodesic flow for that is an Anosov flow which has the specification property. Moreover, there is a Morse lemma, which says that geodesics in your metric remain close to geodesics in the negative curvature metric. In other words, if you pick two points in the universal cover and you connect them via two geodesics, one in each metric, the distance between those two curves is uniformly bounded above independently of the points you chose. And what this means is that your specification property in the negative curvature metric gives you the ability, so where's our definition of specification? It's all the way up at the top now. You give me a list of orbit segments. These are geodesic segments in my no conjugate points metric in G. I use the Morse lemma to take those and turn them into G naught orbit segments. For G naught, the negative curvature metric, I have specification. So I find a shadowing orbit, which again is a G naught geodesic, and then I use the Morse lemma again to turn it into a G geodesic, which is my original orbit, which shadows my original orbits to some very large scale. This a priori is a problem because specification said for all delta greater than zero you can do this. So what you get is specification at a single large scale. And fortunately, we have a uniqueness result which says you do get a unique MME given specification at a single scale and expansivity at a certain comparable scale. However, you have no hope of expansivity in general because this large scale may be much larger than the injectivity radius of your manifold, of your surface. So you go to a finite cover. So you glue together a bunch of fundamental domains. You go to a finite cover of your manifold, and that's a finite cover of your original geodesic flow, and so this one has a unique MME if and only if this one does. And then the one upstairs, you want to get expansivity. Well, you don't necessarily know expansivity, but you can prove it for almost every point for any ergodic measure of positive entropy. So this uh, again, this basically uses uh, Ruel inequality to get positive non-zero Lyapunov exponents, and then a little Pessin theory to show some transversality, and therefore the horospheres have to intersect at exactly one point, and that gives you some expansivity. So the point of these is just that you get your specification and almost expansivity at a certain scale, which by a result by myself and Dan Thompson, 2016 
gives uniqueness of the MME. Using that, it's now possible to go back and do the Patterson-Sullivan construction. So in the setting of no conjugate points, you still have your ideal boundary of the universal cover. And you still have, and this ideal boundary gives a way of representing vectors in terms of a product, because every vector is determined by where it's, where the endpoints of the geodesic are on the boundary at infinity, and by how far along it you are. And this gives you a local product structure, and using an approach due to a recent paper by Russell Ricks, who proved these same asymptotic periodic orbit estimates for geodesic flows on cat zero spaces, uh, we can define a flow box, not in terms of an unstable and stable uh, splitting, because we don't have those, but at least not in a, in a nice global continuous way as we would like, but define them, define the box B in terms of a small neighborhood C minus, a small neighborhood C plus, and points which where this last parameter are with between zero and epsilon. And so you get something, so you're looking at all of the geodesics which connect something in C minus to something in C plus, and then you take an epsilon piece of each of them. This gives you something which plays the role of a flow box, and for that you can, uh, you can identify the components of the intersection, so my gamma is up there, my gamma of t, actually turns out to be a subset of the fundamental group, which is one reason for the notation. For appropriate elements there, you can prove a closing lemma by asking these to be mapped into themselves and then just getting an intersection. But I think I've already run over time, so I better leave it there, and thank you for listening. <laughs>